Hi, I'm Kristen and welcome to my channel, Traveling with Kristen, your destination for learning everything you ever wanted to know about traveling and some of the things you didn't know you needed to know. <laughs> You're watching an episode of Digital Nomad Destinations, a show where we break down what it's like to live and work in different cities and countries around the world. From cost of living to what the food is like, the climate, internet speeds, transportation, housing, nightlife, and lifestyle. It's like Geography Now plus Wild on E plus Anthony Bourdain plus HGTV. So make sure to subscribe so you too can be a travel expert. Now let's get started. Today's episode is about Japan. Probably not the first place you think about living as a remote worker or world traveler, but hear me out. I speak from experience when I say it's awesome and a very underrated digital nomad destination. Pretty much everyone who goes to Japan becomes what's called a Japanophile. Definition, someone who's obsessed with Japan. Same. I went to Japan for two weeks last year, but ended up staying for three months. So that's saying something. Here's what I learned. About Japan. Japan's located to the east of Asia with a population of 125 million people. The country is made up of four islands, Hokkaido to the north, Honshu, the main island in the middle, and Shikoku and Kyushu in the south. The most popular places for digital nomads and expats to live tend to be in the bigger cities, like Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. I know I say this a lot, but this actually is ridiculous. Like, this is absurdly beautiful. I don't know why these three cities exactly, but I do know that Tokyo is one of the coolest and most dynamic cities in the world. Osaka is unique in that it has a really low cost of living compared to some of the other cities in Japan. And Kyoto has been voted one of the top destinations in the world many times over, so that probably has something to do with it. If you want to see more about what it's like to live in Tokyo and Kyoto specifically, make sure to check out my travel vlogs on those cities. So when should you go? When should you visit Japan? Well, that depends on what you're looking for. The beauty of Japan is that due to its geography, you can sometimes find all four seasons there at the same time. For example, it could be dumping snow in Hokkaido, while other people are hitting up the beach in Okinawa. So I learned today that the reason for all the powder in Japan is that the winds come off Siberia, and when it hits the, the sea of Japan, it just like creates moisture and it just dumps. So that's why it looks like this. Speaking of which, winter is becoming a more and more popular time to go because of the amazing skiing and snowboarding in Japan, especially in a town called Niseko, which has the highest annual snowfall in the world. I highly recommend checking it out. It is amazing. Well guys, I have to say it's been an amazing day. This is my first time ever skiing in powder. It's just incredible. Um, it's just been such a good day. If you do come in winter though, you might want to stick around for spring to see the famous sakura or cherry blossom season. Apparently the fall is really nice too when the leaves change. I haven't been there during that time, but either way you can find a mix of climates depending on what you're looking for all year round. Getting around. Tokyo has two main international airports, Haneda and Narita, but there are also quite a few regional international airports throughout the country. So you can find quite a few direct flights. Once you're in Japan though, the fastest and most fun way to get around in my opinion is on one of the high-speed trains. 
I'm partial to the Shinkansen, which used to be the fastest train in the world, but unfortunately it's expensive. You can pay hundreds of dollars for a one-way ticket or for a JR rail pass. And like many other things that you're about to find out, it's not the only thing that's pricey. To save money though, you can take the night buses instead, or even flying is cheaper than the trains, but to each their own. Speaking of which, let's talk cost of living. Um, TLDR, expensive. Japan is expensive, especially if you're living there short term. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it just is. I spent time mostly in Tokyo, Naseko, Kyoto, and Hiroshima, and I found that that is pretty much the order of most to least expensive destinations in my experience. So you can live more economically in the villages but the problem that you could run into there is infrastructure and communication as very few people speak English. So how expensive are we talking here? Well, the average price of an Airbnb right now in Tokyo is $150 a night. And when I lived there, I paid between $1,600 and $2,000 a month for my own room in a co-living space. It's pretty hard to find a one bedroom Airbnb for less than a hundred bucks a night, but some hotels can be cheaper. The problem with hotels is that they typically have tiny, tiny rooms or even sleeping pods. So you wouldn't necessarily want to live there. I'm in Japan. This is the smallest room I've ever seen. Nice uh, robe. Thank God there's a window. Oh. There's slippers everywhere. Slippers. Slippers on the plane. Slippers in the hotel. Everything is very organized and very clean. Here we have the uh, sanitary inspector. Uh, there's recycling in the hotel room. There's lots of signage everywhere. On the other end, there's absolutely no limit to how expensive a hotel or apartment in Tokyo can be. You can easily spend $500 or $1,000 a night in a luxury hotel. However, outside of Tokyo, I've paid as low as $40 or $50 a night in Hiroshima and Kyoto, and apparently it can be even cheaper in Osaka, so make sure to check that out. So in general, you're looking at $1,500 to $3,000 a month in rent for your own furnished place, short term. Long term, it's a bit more affordable. You can get your rent down to maybe $1,000 a month or even less, but you need to commit. There's also a new co-living space called Chapter 2 Tokyo that's advertising rates as low as $9.98 per month and that's including all of your monthly utilities. So if you do fall in love with Japan, how long can you stay? Okay, in general, citizens of most developed countries can stay in Japan for up to 90 days at a time. However, Japan does have some long-term visa options. There's one relatively new visa program called the startup visa and you can also apply for a student visa maybe you want to learn japanese or you can apply for a work permit if you can find a local company to sponsor you what about the internet long story short the internet is really weird in japan i was expecting it to be a lot faster and more plentiful but it's complicated. So you can get Wi-Fi at a lot of the coffee shops and even in convenience stores, but not all of them. And it's also not a very user-friendly experience once you do find a public Wi-Fi connection. You typically need to create an account and usually the form is in Japanese and then the connection can be really weak and slow and it'll usually cut you off after 30 minutes or so and then you have to log back in anyway. The SIM cards are not that much better. They can be slim on data and super expensive. Also coming in really small sizes, like one to three gigs for 30 days, for example. 
The best ones I found, ironically, were in the airport, which is usually the worst place to buy a SIM card abroad, but it is what it is. So stock up on arrival. Pro tip, I also recommend bringing your own Wi-Fi with you. I use some devices like Skyroam and TEP Wireless that work in over 100 countries. If you're interested, you can check them out in the links in the description below. Google Fi is also a pretty popular worldwide data plan for your phone if you want to go that route. Um, but all this being said, even though the public Wi-Fi and the 4G can be a bit clunky, the wired internet connections are really fast and reliable, so you should be fine working at home or in a co-working space. Despite all of the complications I personally experienced in my daily life trying to find Wi-Fi outside of my co-living house, Japan apparently ranks number six in the world for internet speeds with an average of 42 Mbps, which is faster than the Netherlands, Estonia, and Hong Kong. So it is what it is. Food. I probably don't even need to tell you this, but Japan has amazing food. Full disclosure, I liked the food so much that I gained about 10 pounds in three months when I lived there, even with snowboarding. It's possible to eat healthy, but it's so tempting to eat out and the food is so beautiful that it's hard to resist. I've been in Japan for 24 hours and I've been living off kimchi, rice, and green tea. And I'm about to go ride some go-karts, so I'm having a snack of more rice. The problem is that when you eat out, the food can be really high in salt, sugar, soy, and oil. So I don't know why the Japanese people aren't fat because they seem to love desserts and Western food. They're also pretty fond of alcohol. The average citizen allegedly consumes over 100 liters of alcohol per year, but they're still skinny. It's not fair, but anyway, Japan, amazing food, lots of alcohol, and like all of us, the Japanese love their coffee and tea. It's some of the best I've had in the world. You can check out my coffee video to see more. So when it comes to the price of food, you're gonna find a very wide range. The most affordable place to eat out is actually the Japanese convenience stores, which sound really weird, but you'll get used to it, trust me. Most of them are open 24 hours a day and you can go there for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Honestly, you could probably live happily ever after in a Japanese convenience store and have everything you need to survive. Adam, 7-Eleven or Lawson? 7-Eleven, every time. Lawson, Lawson's where it's at. 7-Eleven, uh -uh, free Wi-Fi. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. And the bank machine. What do you love about 7-Eleven? Besides that, free well, Wi-Fi, bank machine, do you like their they, food more? They're not just a, a shopping outlet, they're also a bank, and this is their bank card. <laughs> See this nice little big Buddha. So you can actually bank it's a seven at card right there. <laughs> See, I'm in it for the food, and I'm going to say that the Lawson has better food, and they're cleaner, and they, they're better stocked. The average price per meal when you're eating out just varies a lot depending on where you go. So during the day, you can get like an executive lunch special for $10 and then spend $150 on dinner. It just depends. Then you can go to the grocery store and buy just regularly priced produce. And then next door in a specialty shop, you could spend 80 or 100 euro on some strawberries or a melon. It's weird. So just try to eat at home and go to the convenience stores and take advantage of special menus and street food and fast food options, which are plentiful. Nightlife. Nightlife in Tokyo is pretty lit, guys. You can stay out all night at a rave and then eat ramen and a beer at 9 a.m. and go home. It's awesome. It's a bit more relaxed outside of the major cities in Japan, but you can always find great bars, really cool hole-in-the-wall dive bars, and especially karaoke bars. In 
Japan, party animals, you can pick your poison. Whether you like drinking beer, wine, sake, or hard liquor, it's all plentiful. What about community? Well, as far as people and culture, the Japanese are probably the nicest, most polite people I've ever met in the world. Yes, even more than Canadians. They actually bow when handing you your receipt at a store. And I once left my umbrella on the subway and I swear they sent out a search party for like three days to find it. Spoiler alert, they didn't find it, but they did call me to let me know the result of their search. And the umbrella that I bought in Japan to replace mine is still going strong a year later. So overall, locals are super nice and accommodating, even though not so many of them speak English. Community-wise, there's a huge expat community in Japan with a lot of opportunities to meet other foreigners. There's a lot of business networking meetups, special events, and just social meetups. I recommend using sites like Internations or Meetup.com or even Facebook to find local events. Dating as a digital nomad in Japan is okay. It's definitely doable. There's plenty of foreigners from around the world like athletes and students, teachers, business people. The biggest challenge I found with dating locals is the language barrier in addition to the cultural differences, but you can definitely make it work. There's a lot of options. Finally, quality of life. Quality of life is extremely high in Japan. It's super safe, super clean, and just comfortable. There's also so much to do in Japan that you'll never get bored. From the history and culture to different outdoor activities, nature, shopping, eating, museums, temples, nightlife, and just traveling around the country in general, you could spend a lifetime in Japan and still find more to see and do. The major downsides of living in Japan as a digital nomad is that there's no obvious digital nomad community there. And there are a lot of co-working spaces like WeWork, for example, but there's not so many co-living spaces. Also, because it's such a big country, people are quite spread out. But the good news is that a lot of the foreigners are all in the same boat, so it's easy to meet other people either way. The other downside is obviously the price. If you're not careful, your budget can get obliterated living in Japan. So just be mindful and you can make it work. So that's my overview of Japan as a digital nomad destination. What do you guys think? Would you live in Japan? Have you been there before? What was your experience? Let me know in the comments. And make sure to check out the many Japan videos on my channel and subscribe to Traveling with Kristen and my other channel, youtube.com slash digital nomad for weekly live streams, interviews, and videos to help you learn how to work online while traveling the world. See you soon.